Good afternoon. I'm Scott Mullins. I'm the president of the Professional Firefighters and Paramedics of North Carolina. We're coming at you live from Asheville, North Carolina, where we are hosting our annual or biannual convention. Uh, I do have some good news to report as one of only two states without any cancer legislation passed. We are now, we've now completed our task and our goal of, of getting our cancer legislation, which I believe is some of the best in the country, in the North Carolina budget. And we couldn't have done it without the support of General President Ed Kelly. He said he'd come down and help us get cancer across the finish line, and he did that. He delivered. He came down, he met with the Speaker of the House, other House leadership members, and Governor Roy Cooper, and we had it teed up, and he came and drove it home and his ultimate closer. We had heard good news about his uh, lobbying skills and he did not disappoint. And so we're very appreciative to him and to the International Association of Firefighters for all their help. Without further ado, your General President of the International Association of Firefighters, General President Ed Kelly. Scotty, thank you very much, brother. Thank you, sir. Keep up the good work down here in North Carolina. Good afternoon, everybody out there. If you're on the East Coast and if you're uh, a little west of that, good morning. Uh, and thank you to Scotty for, if he's going back out, to jump back up at the dais and continue to run his convention here in North Carolina. But we just had the Speaker of the House, uh, who's a, a great uh, friend of ours, Tim Moore, that uh, a, a Republican Speaker of the House that was an absolute champion of providing some presumptive cancer funding for firefighters to help families and one of the families um, in North Carolina that's been impacted by cancer is uh, when we're here in Asheville, North Carolina. There's an Asheville firefighter who died in 2018 by the name of Will Willis. Uh, he was only 34 years old and left behind four young children uh, at the time under the age of 10, I believe. So it's, a, it's only, um, it's very fitting that we're here in Asheville and just yesterday we found out that in fact that all the efforts by the firefighters here in North Carolina were successful and prior to this budget being passed here in North Carolina there was only two states North Carolina and Delaware that did not have any cancer presumption protection at all so it's a tremendous victory it's uh, we have a, a good friend in, in, in the speaker and uh, they're doing great work down here in North Carolina we can all be proud of and, that's what the whole thing's about. It's about taking care of our families. It's about, you know, I like to say that the mission of the IFF starts in front of a church. And uh, we work backwards from there. And it's our job, each and every one of us, to protect each other. You know, we take an oath to go out in the street and protect strangers, which is a very noble calling. In, in the union, when you take that second oath and become a union officer, it's about taking care of the firefighters. And that means taking care of their families. And in that vein, you know, I've, I'm, I've been honored and blessed to be elected as your general president uh, I'm about seven months in office now and in some ways seems like the blink of an eye in other ways it's uh seems like a long time ago that i was uh secretary treasurer but that being said you know we have a lot going on we're making some good changes here in, in the uh, iff positive changes to build upon the great work that's been done over the course of 103 years here at the iff and uh one of the um big bodies of work that has been underway is our, our transition team report, which we have over 21 working, uh, 21 working groups with over 80 IFF affiliate leaders that have served on the transition team, looking at all aspects of the IFF, evaluating every bit of the services and, and dealing with issues that uh, we're facing. You know, when we look at our services, we looked at our operations in Canada, disaster relief, uh, education and training, grants and hazmat, health and safety, legal services, political resources, strategic campaigns, technical assistance, our tier division that, that does uh, a lot of our analysis, things like geographical mapping for response times, as well as municipal financial, financial audits and uh, uh, wage comps, uh, things such as that. And then we took a look at some issues that, that impact us as, as IFF members, things like collective bargaining, our federal firefighters, human relations, um, Sorry. Human relations. Uh, can you hear me? All right, good. Uh, human relations, innovation and research. Think about our future, where we need to be in 5, 10, 20 years. Uh, organizing and new leadership. Uh, political endorsements. 
retiree issues, our SMART program, and our state and provincial associations, how to, how to address some of the issues that they are facing. We also looked at our subsidiary groups, things like our relationship with muscular dystrophy and the IFF Foundation, as well as our IFF Financial Corporation. Uh, probably one of the more uh, exciting things that we have done at the IFF since uh, in the last seven months is we've created a science and research department. We brought in Derek Irwin, who's a local 1014 uh, LA County firefighter. Derek is uh, this month uh, getting his PhD from UCLA in chemistry. He's dedicated his adult life to uh, trying to fight the ravages cancer has on firefighters. And uh, we're very excited about that. And we're ready to take on the challenges that come with it. That means stepping up to uh, the corporate interests that, that you know, really have, a, have their financial bottom line invested in, in making sure that their chemicals are in our everyday life. And that includes things like our, our personal protective equipment that have PFAS uh, infused into it. And one of the things that we're working on here at the IFF is making sure that we get those carcinogens out of our bunker gear. Uh, it boggles my mind that our PPE actually has carcinogens in it. So we're working hard towards uh, eradicating that. Uh, we're also working on our, our behavioral health. Uh, we've, we've made great strides at the IFF in behavioral health. Believe it or not, in various aspects of behavioral health, we've trained 19,000 people uh, in different aspects of it, including our peer support, which has been a, a burgeoning need amongst our membership, whether it's after disasters such as um, the hurricanes or the wildfires out west, or uh, issues like Surfside, where we had the collapse and we had a um, workplace violence incident in LA County that was devastating where we lost a member uh, at the hands of another member. So our peer support's been very, very busy. That's been out uh, quite a bit. We've sent teams out and we have about 6,800 uh, peer support people trained so far. So we're working on that. Hopefully, you know, every state and, and all of our uh, locals have access to peer support as they need it. We've also signed uh, a, a contract to build a center of excellence on the West Coast in Hemet, California. So excited about that. We also passed a resolution this last convention to explore down the road uh, a potential center in the Midwest. We're also very happy to report that um, we're entering into a partnership uh, in Canada. So we'll have five centers across Canada that our members will have access to. So we're um, we're working hard on our behavioral health challenges and make sure that each and every one of us, um, the first step to getting a brother or sister help is to recognize it. And if you have, you know, sometimes you, you don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. And then there's other times where someone who needs help, it's pretty obvious. They're not showing up to work. They're missing runs on the firehouse. They're, you know, breaking out in handcuffs. Uh, these are all signs that people need help. And if you, you know, if we're gonna really take care of each other, sometimes you have to have those difficult conversations. And we have resources that the IFF provides to help. So if you need help or someone that you work with needs help, reach out. Uh, one of the other um, new aspects that we're growing into is we're forging a partnership with the American Cancer Society, uh, which is also has an affiliation with the Can uh, Canadian Cancer Society. Um, that, that official announcement will be December 2nd. Uh, we're gonna go to New York City to do that with the ACS. Uh, but we're excited about that. Um, it comes with a lot of resources that in partnership with the Firefighter Cancer Support Network, when a member gets diagnosed, we'll have greater resources for them to uh, help navigate uh, dealing with their cancer and getting treatment. Uh, another important aspect of it is it, it will provide in housing in some cities near cancer treatment facilities. A great benefit for our membership. And a very important is it's, it's one of the leading research and data uh, collection points is the American Cancer Society. So with partnership with our own um, firefighter cancer database um, that we passed in Congress, it'll be a great research, for, uh, research tool for us to study how cancer impacts us. And, and again, you know, that's all of our job, right? To take care of each other, make it a little safer, take care of our families. And if I do anything during my tenure as IFF general president, I hope it's move the needle on, on cancer and make our job a little safer, um, a lot safer, hopefully. But we'll keep working towards that. 
We also have our nuts and bolts of, uh, of the operation, things like our tier division, our technical assistance division with, that does the municipal financial audits, et cetera. Uh, we're brought in, uh, which was a resolution at convention, a new analyst, which has reduced our turnaround times for those reports, which is very helpful. Uh, we also have our regular day-to-day -day stuff that we're doing. We think that the work that's going on in Congress with the infrastructure bill that was signed by the president yesterday, we're gonna double our hazmat money from the federal government, which will increase our ability to pump that education out there. We also have uh, our grant money, our Safer Act, I think it's 267 million. We have uh, another, I believe 60 million in um, Fire Act money and about 4 million on fire prevention grant. So things are moving forward there. We are um, pushing hard, trying to pass collective bargaining, which has been our number one priority. It's a struggle in, uh, in Congress, you know, it's tough to, it's tough to move legislation and um, well, We'll keep, put, we'll keep pushing away on that. We're also working towards um, providing a product on, by the way, in collective bargaining, we'll point out that we had a couple big wins. One being Fairfax County, Virginia. Uh, they adopted collective bargaining for their firefighters. We also had, uh, I think, which is a great, great symbol, is the city of Atlanta now has collective bargaining for firefighters, which is a great beacon of hope for all of us. I know that uh, we've had other locals in Georgia that have led the way in getting collective bargaining for firefighters. And I know one of our presidents down there, uh, Andrea Hall, played a pivotal role in that. Congratulations to the work that she's done as well as the Atlanta local for the work that they've done. Great job. Um, we're also working towards providing a, a new product um, with the IFF Financial Corporation to try to bridge that gap between being Medicare eligible as well as you know from the time that you retire so with the board of directors of the iff financial corporation which in my opinion it has unbelievable potential and is doing tremendous things um, we're going to be offering we're partnered with the northwest firefighter health trust um, coming out of the, the seventh district of the iff and looking to expand and build that product out so that we'll be able to provide um, insurance to everybody, not just um, those that need the bridge between retirement and being Medicare eligible, but also uh, all of our membership. You know, it's a exciting avenue that we're going down and forging, and, and we look forward to being able to deliver that uh, for IFF members across the United States. Um, we also have, um, you know, great products being built in the IFF Financial Corporation, like cancer coverage. Uh, for our members. We're also renegotiating all of our plans uh, to make sure we're getting good market value uh, across the board. So I think the IFF Financial Corporation is has done great work. Uh, there were some things that we knew we needed to approve upon and, and make sure that um, we're putting the members first. But I can tell you, research the products that the IFF Financial Corporation is offering. They could be right for you and your families. And what we do is take the revenues from that and help support the IFF. 3% of our overall budget comes from revenue from the IFF Financial Corporation. It's about $2.5 million. That's significant. That's money that goes right towards impact in our health and safety, our ability to uh, advocate for ourselves at the bargaining table, our ability to be pol uh, politically strong. All that matters. And that's what the IFF Financial Corporation supports. So I encourage you to get involved in uh, and, and help push that out to your members. It's about paying it forward for each other. So uh, it's very exciting. This is, a, you know, I love this forum. It's an ability to kind of have a back and forth with our entire membership. And it's, uh, it's pretty new. So we did have some great questions that were offered uh, from members in the field. And I look forward to uh, answering them for you. So I appreciate it. Uh, with that, Jamie Burgess is here from Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, great IFF local, and uh, he's going to help facilitate uh, this Facebook live session and work with some questions and see what pops up. <clears throat> All right, uh, General President Kelly, this first question comes from Portland, Oregon, local 43 in the 9th District. Can you give an update on the IFF strategic campaigns team and any plans to train and or grow strategic campaigns at the state and provincial level? That is a great question, I'll tell you. Um, strategic campaigns, for those of you that don't know, 
is a force multiplier for a local that is in a particular battle. You know, one place that always sticks out in my mind is East Chicago, Indiana. They have a mayor who, believe it or not, was a career firefighter, got elected as mayor, uh, and a couple of years ago, put them on an eight hour work shift. And they weren't even on a set eight hours, they were on a rotating one where you'd work Monday day, Tuesday swing, Wednesday overnight, uh, which is you know terrible on the body. We know how sleep deprivation uh, plays a, a terrible role in the overall health of anybody. And we look at locals like that where they have major issues that could impact everybody. The IFF has a strategic campaigns department that will go in and help the local build in a public education and a political campaign to try to draw awareness and put pressure on the decision makers to treat us fairly. I think that the strategic campaigns department is um, the future of how we deal with issues. If you could picture uh, you know, the overall, to make an analogy, the overall IAFF as say the Department of Defense, I think strategic campaigns in our head has to be like the, the special forces that you send in to pinpoint uh, and stand up and fight for our members where there's a particular need and problem that arises. Uh, and that would come up through your district vice presidents and the district field service reps and state reps. So strategic campaigns is incredibly important. We just had our budget meeting. Uh, we had the longest, myself and GST Lima, uh, proud that we hold a record of the longest budget meeting in the history of the IFF. But uh, we did great work. We, we strategically funded the foundation of the IFF, but made sure that uh, our, de our deliverables were met. And in that was strategic campaigns. So we're looking at expanding for sure. And uh, the need is, is there. And we hope that the strategic campaigns gets built out in the future. We have an upcoming convention uh, here this summer coming up in Ottawa, Canada. And um, we hope that we can make some strategic investment in places that we need to, like strategic campaigns. All right, this next question is from Loveland, Colorado, local 3566 in the 9th District. Can you provide an update on national collective bargaining rights for firefighters? So, thanks to a good friend of ours in Congress, Representative Dan Kildee from Michigan, a uh, Democrat from Michigan, uh, who has, comes from a long family of firefighters, and is a great champion of all of our efforts in Congress, filed our National Collective Bargaining Bill. Um, it's currently, as you know, Congress is a very, uh, a very tough place to move anything. And for those of you that are in the state and provincial level of IFF leadership, you know how difficult sometimes it is to move anything through the legislative body uh, anywhere. And Congress is no different. It's even, I'd, I'd argue, being a former state president and state legislative agent, uh, more difficult at times. So we have uh, several bills in Congress that um, impact national collective bargaining. We have the PRO Act from the AFL-CIO that is an overall uh, encompassing bill that would enable us to collectively bargain. There's also the AFSCME bill which is uh, deals with collective bargaining for our public employees that we would be uh, incorporated in. And then we have our own bill, our own standalone firefighter national collective bargaining bill, which is what our collective bargaining committee wanted to do with the, st the strategy that we took, which, um, you know, it makes it competitive where they were trying to move bills that essentially do the same thing for us. And we've met with, uh, uh, leaders in Congress to articulate the need to we really want our bill moving and uh, one of the challenges we have with all of these bills that impact labor positively is when you get to the Senate although there is a, a majority with the vice president um, theoretically voting in favor of us which would tip us to a you know a majority that would support this bill it doesn't get us to the the 60 count that we need in the Senate to pass legislation. So our fight remains in the Senate for national collective bargaining. And as I mentioned, you know, when we look at different tactics, when you have places like Atlanta passing collective bargaining, it gives us hope and a path that from a strategy standpoint, we've been filing collective bargaining in Congress year in and year out. Um, you know, I think one of our senior DVPs said about 50 years. Um, if we put focus back on some of our 
local governments, um, there may be an avenue there for us to achieve what we're setting out to do. I mean, it doesn't mean we take our eye off the ball. It doesn't mean we don't keep fighting in Congress. Uh, and that's certainly something that I intend to do. But it, it is still an uphill battle to pass it in Congress, in particular with the Senate, um, the way it is. <clears throat> All right, this next question is from Jefferson City, Missouri, local 671 in the 2nd District. When can we expect the Ethical Practices Committee report to be released? Okay, um, the Ethical Practices Committee report is very, very broad, very significant. It's probably, you know, it was a total of, I think, 16 different reports. Six of those reports were released back in January by a vote of 9 to 8 on the Executive Board to release them. And I was, I was a secretary treasurer at the time, and I was um, proud to be able to say I was the ninth vote that released those reports because I think transparency is paramount. Um, we had an additional 10 reports were delivered to the executive board. Uh, the executive board met and debated them. Uh, we had actually gone through a process with the uh, legal committee to look at potential redactions that were recommended for a multitude of reasons um, by a general counsel. Um, and essentially what the executive board chose to do was redact, uh, heavily redact all of the committee reports, basically every redaction that the, that the um, general counsel recommended, some of which was just like to protect people's identity, like mine, which I, I voted in favor, I believe in transparency, I think, you know, trying to protect my identity was not in the best interest of the IFF. So they also voted to not release the investigative reports, which were the reports that the outside law firm that was staffed by investigators um, produced that really tell the tale. And I, I come from the school of thought that transparency in an organization like ours, in particular with a post Janus environment where our members um, need to believe in what the IFF is doing for them to belong. And where we have a generation of uh, new members coming on board that, that are used to being able to get information at the tip of their fingertips, you know, just with their phones. And transparency is key in order to um, instill the faith that we need in, in the organization to be strong going forward, to have that unity that we need. So uh, I believe in transparency. I believe that we should have released those reports. I mean, the majority of the district vice presidents thought that that was not in the best interest, that um, we should uh, not release those reports. And, and that's, you know, for you members to take up with, you know, the electeds in the IFF. All right, next coming from the Metropolitan Washington Airport Authority, local 3217 in the fourth district. Uh, how does the IAFF plan to um, consider the, the personal ideals and, and beliefs of the majority of the membership when it comes to endorsing political candidates? That's a very good question. When you talk about trying to preserve and maintain unity and solidarity in, in, in an organization like ours, in a union like ours, um, making sure that we have, I'll go back to the word transparency, um, is paramount and when we vet an elected candidate it's on the issues that are only germane to our professional lives as firefighters and paramedics and dispatches and basically IFF members and we don't weigh into issues that are outside of where do they stand on collective bargaining where do they stand on our pensions where do they stand on our access to health care do they support our staffing levels? Do they support the grant money that comes out of the government? You know, do they support us as firefighters? We don't get into the other issues, things like foreign policy, the border, abortion, guns. Those are all important issues. And our members have a right to, uh, to their own individual vote. But it's our job as your leaders in the IFF to vet candidates see where they stand on the issues that are germane to us as IFF members, and then educate the membership as to who supports them on the issues of what they do as a profession. 
Uh, it doesn't take your vote away. You know, it's up to every individual to have your own priority list and what's important to you. And um, I think that as we go forward, uh, the transition team analyzed that and came in with some recommendations that we'll be vetting through the executive board on what kind of policy we want. But I think that making sure that our members are heard uh, is paramount to, even if we don't disagree, even if we disagree, you're not going to like every decision that comes out of the executive board. And let me rest assured, no union is perfect. Whether it's the union of a man and a woman or the union of the your local or this international. No union is perfect. But it's the only shot we have to protect each other is our collective voice in the political arena. Politicians sign our checks. They pass the laws that dictate how we're treated when we retire, how we're treated if we get hurt in the line of duty and God forbid killed, what our family's benefits will look like. All that matters. That, that's, what the, that's what the IFF's about. When we vet a candidate, that's, where we, that's how we rate them. And, um, for, you know, and, and I get it, a lot of our members are more right-leaning um, than some of our political endorsements have been. But our political endorsements, you know, to a great extent, have been, the Democratic Party has supported a lot of our issues. With exception, we have a lot of Democratic mayors that have not treated uh, the firefighters well and underfunded them and cut them and made our jobs more dangerous. And then we have Republicans that are champions, like the speaker here in North Carolina, like my governor up in Massachusetts is a Republican. It's been great to the firefighters, signed every piece of pro-firefighter legislation we put on his desk. Our loyalty can't be to a party our loyalty has to be to each other. I say our loyalty is to dead firefighters, past and future. And we support those that support us on our issues, period. And, uh, you know, it's up to us to make sure we have a transparent process and, and do a good job educating you. All right. This next question is from Lafayette, Indiana, local 472 in the 8th District. So we're seeing a lot of our members have uh, action taken against them for refusing to be vaccinated. Um, how will the I, IAFF assist our brothers and sisters when it comes to vaccine mandates, especially for those of us who do not have collective bargaining agreements? It's a tough, you know, the, the mandate's a very tough issue. Um, you know, we've always been clear. We support vaccination. We think that we should demand that uh, our local, our IFF locals um, have input into any potential mandate. Um, I know in places like in my home local, we've negotiated a test or mandate policy. Um, and I get that not everybody has the ability to negotiate, but you should be able to sit down across the table from management and discuss the issues and find a path if there's alternatives, etc. But if it's a mandate, it's got to be implemented properly. And when you look at places, I'll give you a place in my opinion that was poorly implemented, New York City. Um, they offered the IFF members nine days to decide whether or not to go off the payroll or get vaccinated. And understandably, those members were upset. And, um, you know, that wasn't a fair approach to how it should have been handled. And these are the same firefighters that in their eyes in New York City was one of the, you know, ground zero of the pandemic, where for the first time in the history of New York City, firefighters were empowered by the medical examiner to pronounce people dead on the street. And their more was, you know, had hit capacity, they were, you know, stacking bodies in refrigerated trucks before there was a vaccine. When they just lived up to the oath they took to put themselves at risk on behalf of the citizens, like we all do, and all did during this pandemic. And uh, I didn't think they were treated fairly. Uh, that being said, when you look at what the science tells us uh, from our own COVID task force that deals with John, you know, we. We work with John Hopkins University doctors to come up with our um, directives. And we've monitored the federal government. We've lost 71 IFF members to COVID. 32 of them just since August 3rd, since the Delta variant really hit. So it's been sig a significant impact on us. And we've lost, you know, they're not all coexisting conditions and underlying medical uh, 
conditions that led to it. Some of them are young, healthy guys in their 20s, uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s. So we've encouraged the vaccine. That being said, when you look at us as your union and what we can do for it at any level, it's, it's negotiate, litigate, or take it to the streets and appeal to the public to put pressure on the decision makers to treat us fairly, whether you have collective bargaining or not. And when you look at those paths, if management won't sit down with you and they, they enforce a mandate, our alternative is to litigate. And every lawyer that we've had, every legal case that's come across us uh, has told us that we can't win that case. It dates back to, it truthfully dates back to 1905 um, dealing with a, a virus that led to a pandemic and whether or not the government can force vaccinations on their citizenry. And what the Supreme Court said, which in a decision I'll mention was written by a Civil War soldier, officer that fought to preserve the Union, that individual liberty is not absolute. That if your individual liberty is threatening the safety and health of others, then the government can step in and force that mandate. So in as much as we all have a visceral reaction in this country that being forced to put something in your body is wrong um, and that it's an infringement on our liberty and our freedom, it was decided generations ago that in this country, and Canada has the same basic legal premise, you don't have that individual liberty. And in the case that we have, where this isn't necessarily the government forcing vaccination on the citizenry, this is an employer forcing vaccination, mandating vaccinations on employees, that standard is even less than a citizen. So we don't have great options for our members that don't want to be vaccinated. Um, you know, if we can negotiate a, 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 a policy that would provide for testing in place of vaccination, it's really the best alternative we've found. But we still, you know, as far as this executive board's concerned, the science has been clear and that getting vaccinated could save your life. So, you know, it's not an, and it's not an easy issue when, when we as the union don't have a lot of arrows in our quiver. All right. <clears throat> the last question comes from Sacramento, California, local 522, the 10th district. Uh, could you provide us with an update on the PFOS working group and where we are at with monitoring and eradicating these chemicals out of our turnout gear and phones? Thank you. Very important. Uh, something near and dear to my heart. I, I mentioned a little while ago, but we do have, uh, I mentioned, you know, we, we brought in our own, we have our own scientist in-house uh, working in the higher ed community with other scientists to help build the data we need to be successful in the standards committees like the NFPA and the regulatory boards. Uh, to make sure we're trying to get these dangerous chemicals not only out of society in general, but certainly particularly out of our gear, as you mentioned, and the foam that we use. And I can tell you, being an Air Force firefighter in my past, uh, when I was in the military, we used AFFF foam all the time. Got it all over me, unfortunately. Um, so we are working. We have two uh, TIAs, they called it, at the NFPA, which are temporary amendments to put a stay on. What drives the need to put PFAS into our bunker gear is a ultraviolet light test that is called for in the NFPA standard for PPE. And that goes on the, the inner layer, the uh, dirt, uh, um, moisture barrier on the inside of our gear. Which if you think about it, if it's sewn into the inside of our gear, it wouldn't get hit by ultraviolet rays. Uh, so what we've filed for is to remove that test, give us an opportunity to go find alternatives, which the industry that does manufacturing of fabrics has never bothered to try to create a, a moisture barrier that would not have carcinogens in it, those PFAS in it. So we're working, we actually had a, a call this week uh, myself and uh, Derek Irwin, the Director of Science and Research, um, trying to partner with um, some of the manufacturers to get some federal funding to try to tackle that issue so that we can build new bunker gear. Um, 
that's obviously, and we, we should never rest till we have carcinogenics eradicated from our PPE. Um, but we also got to think big picture too, like Project Fires is being uh, redone. Project Fires was a federally funded study done uh, in the 1970s on the status of the fire service in the United States. And very happy to report that because of our successful political efforts and, and the great talent that we've produced throughout the IFF, um, Dr. Laurie Moore Merrill uh, has been named the U.S. Fire Administrator. She's such a talent, a, a very, a very, um, a great champion for firefighters and has been for decades. And, and she'll do great work for us. But I think, you know, we are working on having a deliverable uh, in the not too distant future on a task force as the resolution and convention called for um, and making sure that we have alternatives to what we're doing. It's imperative. And, um, you know, we're getting there. There's a lot of hills to climb, a lot of battles to be had, a lot of corporate money pushing back at us. But we're not afraid of the fight. You know, so be it. That's all the questions we got. Just FYI, the governor is going to sign our cancer bill into law. So, well, we, we just found that out. Good news that the, uh, the governor of North Carolina is going to sign uh, the cancer funding into law. Uh, do we know when? Uh, we do not know. The date. So that's great news here in North Carolina for our members. And, you know, uh, I got to tell you that I mentioned him earlier, but uh, Will Willis was a 34-year-old firefighter here in Asheville with four kids uh, that were very young. And he was diagnosed with a very rare form of kidney cancer that the prognosis was uh, not good. And with no cancer protections here in this state, he had uh, some tough realities to face. Like his little kids, not only weren't they gonna have their dad, but you know, things are gonna be tough in that house. And um, in order to save money, he had his cousin, who's also an Asheville firefighter, put him in a pine box and, and drive him up on a hill and bury him, you know, to save the money that they had had for his wife and kids. And, um, you know, that was 2018. There's plenty of fight for this IFF to have going forward. And uh, if you're an IFF leader, keep leading. Thank you for doing what you're doing. If you're an IFF member, get involved. We need help carrying this cross. And uh, if you need some fire in your belly, think about Will Willis' four kids. All right? God bless everybody. Be you, be strong, be firefighters. Thank you.